This is the Book Waves Arts Waves Hour. Interviews with writers on KPFA's nationally syndicated Book Waves program, along with interviews about film and theater and archive book interviews that stretch back four decades. I'm your host, Richard Walensky. Today on the Book Waves portion of the program, an interview with Heather Cox Richardson, whose latest book is How the South Won the Civil War. Her daily news update, Letters from an American, has become an online phenomenon, and she discusses both during the interview. And on the Arts Waves part of the program, an interview with Laurel Olstein, whose play Pandora, produced on Zoom, streams via TheaterWorks Silicon Valley, September 24th through 28th. First, though, here are some announcements in the world of local bookstores and theater companies. You can find links to all these websites and others on today's program page at kpfa.org. Book Passage Conversations with Authors features Ayad Akhtar on Saturday, September 19th at 4 p.m. and Wade Davis Sunday, September 20th, also at 4 p.m. A special event with Al Sharpton is Thursday, October 1st at 5.30 p.m. The Booksmith features Lucy Lane Bledsoe Tuesday, September 22nd at 8 p.m. And the Bay Area Book Festival presents Berkeley Unbound, an all-day free virtual mini-festival on Sunday, October 4th, and it's kicked off with a ticketed program on Saturday night, October 3rd. Over in the world of theater, San Francisco Playhouse, the Zoomlet play, Monday, September 21st at 7 p.m. is The Logic by Will Arbery. At Custom Made Theater, Sarah rules how to transcend a happy marriage recorded during its January to February run, streams September 18th to 20th, on demand 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. Over at American Conservatory Theater, ACT, in Love and Warcraft, by Marjorie Shaker, is streaming on demand from the live production September 18th to 25th. The Thanksgiving play by Larissa Fast Horse live streams September 25th to October 3rd, and then on demand October 9th to October 18th. At Berkeley Rep, Romantics Anonymous, live from the Old Vic in Bristol, England, it's a musical with book by Emma Rice, lyrics by Christopher Diamond, and music by Michael Kuhlman, September 26th at 1 p.m. And It can Happen Here, which is a four-part radio play, airs on October 13th at 5 p.m. And Cal Shakes, California Shakespeare Theater's direct address series, continues with another series, Resisting Shakespeare, or How to Fall in and Out and In and Out of Love. That series begins on September 18th at 5 p.m. Coming up now, the Book Waves part of the Book Waves Arts Waves Hour. My guest is Heather Cox Richardson, whose latest book is How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Democracy, and the Continuing Fight for the Soul of America. Heather Cox Richardson is a professor of history at Boston College, author of five previous works, and most notably from September 15th, it became one year of daily letters from an American, which is on Facebook. Before we get into the topic of the book, when you began this, what were your thoughts and how did you view your daily update? When did you realize that it was something not quite what you expected? It's a great question. And, and I think it says a lot about the letters themselves of how they started. I did not start these letters at all, really. I had a, a Facebook page, a professional Facebook page that had about 22,000 followers. And I wrote an essay about once a week on it about something, you know, I, I love to write. So I wrote about something, but I often discussed um, questions of, of history and of modern politics. And what happened was that on September 13th, Friday, September 13th, and I read the news, I'm a total news junkie. I saw that Adam Schiff had written a letter to the acting director of national intelligence at the time, uh, telling him that, that Schiff knew that he was withholding a whistleblower complaint and that because he was holding the whistleblower complaint, contrary to what the law required he do, that there was no con conclusion that Adam Schiff, who was the, the chair of the um, House Intelligence Committee, could make other than the idea that he was protecting somebody quite high up in the administration and he'd better hand that 
that letter over in a hurry. And I saw that in, on the 13th, and I recognized that was a really big deal because it was a member of the legislative bl- branch calling out a specific member of the executive branch for breaking a law. That's different than like the emoluments clause in the Constitution that people have been all over or whatever. This was a specific law. But I was moving at the time. I had just started the new semester, you know, my life was crazy and I reacted to it personally, but I didn't do much with it. And then on the 15th, in the process of moving, I was painting the outside of my house and I got stung by a yellow jacket and I'm allergic to them. And of course, I did not have my EpiPen and I live in the country, way out in the country, a long way from really medical care and stuff. And so I, I knew I basically had to observe the sting and see how I was going to react to it. And I had nothing to do, and I was, of course, anxious. So I thought, well, you know, I haven't written on my Facebook page in a while. I'll go ahead and, and, and catch them up to date on what's been going on. So I wrote a post on the 15th. It was a Sunday. And people like poured in with all kinds of questions. And I, I did, didn't like to put things on that more than once a week because I thought people would get bored that I'd be taking up too much space. But I thought, well, you know, I guess I'll go ahead and answer their questions. So I wrote again, and then more and more questions poured in and it was pretty clear that something big was going on. I think it was probably a matter of a month or so later that I I wrote to my uh, university dean and said, just so you know, something big is happening and I, I just need to make sure it's on your radar screen. So I knew pretty early on that it was hitting uh, a chord. To this day, I don't understand why, but I'm glad it is and I'm glad that, uh, you know, that I seem to be helping people make it through this moment. What does it feel like suddenly to become this kind of strange kind of celebrity? Well, what's funny about it is that my life really hasn't changed that much at all. I'm a writer, and and I sit at a computer and I write. I do research and I write. And it doesn't matter if I'm writing to one person or to a million people. My computer looks the same. My study looks the same. The glass of seltzer water I have beside me looks the same. So from my perspective, I'm exactly the same person I was a year ago before all this started. But I will say something that I think is really important about the tone of the letters is that when the numbers started to get into crazy numbers, I made it a point to not to think about that. When I write those letters, I am literally envisioning a few of my close friends and family so that it doesn't ever get, you know, if if you read me in, in major papers, there's a very different voice. And I work very hard to make sure I don't adopt that voice, that I'm speaking to my friends, not to some larger societal, you know, body. And I think that really matters a, a lot in the way that the letters have been. The stuff that I try and do is really almost to model democracy. I mean, somehow our government seems so distant to so many of us. And it's not distant. It's us. And to sort of say, you know, this matters to me because it impacts my life in this way or because I am personally offended by this. There was one letter early on, I don't remember now even what the topic was, but I said, you know, I know I'm talking about this in a really callous way and what might seem like a cold way, but that's because I wrote a book about this and it still hits very, very hard. And so we're on really tender ground for me right now. And I think that that made it seem more real to people because it wasn't just some national story that see, that you saw in the New York Times or in, you know, the Portland Press Herald. It was somebody saying, you know, I'm having a hard time going about my day to day because this is really knocking the, the ground out from underneath my feet. But I want to talk briefly about events that you wrote about last night on September 10th. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, I only got three hours of sleep the night before because the night before was one of the most important ones I'd ever written. So last night was a bit of a rush, but go ahead. You talked about that Fauci was told to lie by his superiors, which brings up the question for me is that should we even trust him at this point? If you read on in that article, now, one of the things I always do, of course, is I cite my sources. You know, so many people seem to think I have some inside track to something. I don't at all. I simply read a lot and I read very quickly. So everything that I write has a source. And I don't cite my historical sources because they're profoundly informed by 30 years of work. And then there would be far more source citations than there would be um, text. But anything I write about the present has a source. And in that article that that was sourced from, and I'm afraid I really don't remember it that well because I was so tired last night, but um, 
I, there was a, a memo, a series of memos, emails that were in, in some fashion, and I'm not going to say how, because again, the article's not in front of me, got into the hands of a, a media outlet. And they, reading them, saw that this aide had repeatedly put pressure on Dr. Fauci not to talk about, for example, um, the need for children to wear masks in schools because this person insisted that children could not spread the virus. We know that's wrong, right? But then if you went further down in the article, that article that I'm citing, Fauci said, I have never been, I've never altered what I was going to say based on any kind of external pressure. And I think if you know Dr. Fauci's work, he began working with, uh, on the AIDS crisis under Ronald Reagan, and he has worked with every president since. He has a sterling reputation for telling the truth. And, you know, I think that's a little, you have to be a little bit careful. If somebody could tell him to censor what he says, that doesn't mean that he's going to do it. Now, he does tend to try and get along with people, so maybe he doesn't speak quite as forcefully as he might personally want to. But, you know, he does seem to me like somebody who is trustworthy. But one of the things that I think is important about this moment is actually the theme of what I was writing about last night, and that is that knowledge is power. You know, being able to control what people know and how they know it has always been the key to retaining political power or societal power in a, in, a, in a community. And one of the things that it's important for people to do, I think, is to think about where they get their sources of information and whether or not they can trust those sources of information. So wondering about Fauci is not a bad idea. Now, if we get a document dropped today that says that Fauci has been, um, you know, secretly taking money from the Martians, I deliberately put that way out there because I, I, again, I try and be careful about somebody hearing me say something and saying, oh, she said, you know, I, I hope you understand, but I don't really think Dr. Anthony Fauci is funded by Martians. But if you hear that, then you've got to adjust what you think about his information. And similarly, you know, you've seen this again and again when, for example, last night, there have always been rumors about this Ukrainian oligarch who was feeding information to Trump's former lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and to Ron Johnson, who's at the head of the Senate um, Homeland Security Committee and theoretically doing this investigation into the, the connection between the um, 2016 Trump campaign and um, and Russian operatives. Um, the, the fact that the, the, the Treasury Department, which is in the executive branch and is headed by Steven Mnuchin, who is a, a staunch Trump supporter, the fact that they have now said that he is a Russian operative, that is, he is a Russian spy. Well, should you take what he says seriously as, as an actual fact? You know, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say no, not unless you're eager to believe the information being fed to us by a foreign power that's eager to, to disrupt our society. So that's a case where you should look at the stuff that's coming out of Rudy Giuliani and out of Ron Johnson and out of Devin Nunes, to whom he has also provided information uh, of California, and say, no, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I've got a second source, a second solid source before I believe anything they say. Again, before we go on to uh, how the South won the Civil War, Heather Cox Richardson, the day before was when the uh, first information from the Woodward books dropped that Trump lied about the virus. And I keep thinking, you know, you spoke to my colleague, Mitch Jezerich, KPFA, a couple of months ago, and the world was different. And so much has happened since. Yet at the same time, if we look at whose people support, it feels like nothing's changed. When looking at it from the perspective of a historian, what are you seeing well, of course, that's a conversation that could literally take years. But one of the things that I think has gotten us to the position we're in is, as I say, access to information. And, and I really want to emphasize that because if you think about being able to make good choices about your life, you need to have access to good information. So, for example, you know, you might love your business partner. But if you discover that your business partner has always been sweet and kind to your face, but at the same time he's been cleaning out the bank accounts, you need to know that he's cleaning out the bank accounts so you can make good decisions about whether or not you're going to continue to work with that person. So having accurate information about your life, about things that matter to you in your life, is actually foundational to being able to have control over your life. And one of the things that has happened um, 
in American in American politics, especially since at least the 1990s, is the rise of a media channel or a media uh, world in which there is a real divorce between reality, what's actually happening, and what what people are saying and what voters have come to believe. And I, when I look at the solid numbers for Trump and this many Trump supporters I know, they are simply bound into a, a worldview that is not based in reality. It's based in a narrative that they have been told. And that's not to say this, I'm not suggesting the whole concept of a people believing in a, um, having a false consciousness and, or I'm sorry, voting against their, against their best interests because they're locked into a false consciousness, but rather that, you know, we make sense of the world by our beliefs. You know, we tell stories about ourselves to, to figure out who we are. You know, you tell a story about your life. Uh, I tell a story about my life and how we see we fit into the world. But countries also tell stories about their lives. And we have the problem right now of a number of people who believe in a story that is not grounded in reality. And people ask me all the time, you know, how do I reach somebody who insists that no matter what he says, Donald Trump is not going to attack Social Security? And my answer to that is, you know, a lot of those people are not reachable because there is nothing in the world to my mind because of the way I think more powerful than the human mind and if you can command somebody's mind you can make them do anything you want them to do and a lot of those people you know are not going to be able to be reintegrated into a reality-based community but that being said there is no way that uh, there would be so many actors trying to advance disinformation and trying vying for our minds if they thought they had locked up the future of America. So I look at the numbers that look solid. I look at the fact that in some states, it appears that Trump is gaining ground. And I look at the fact that Russian operatives are trying to affect the way we think about things in America. And I say, they would not be trying so hard if they thought the game was already won. You're listening to an interview with Heather Cox Richardson, whose latest book is titled, How the South Won the Civil War oligarchy, democracy, and the continuing fight for the soul of America. Her daily column, Letters from an American, can be found on her Facebook page or heathercoxrichardson.substack.com. I'm Rich Walensky on the Book Waves, Arts Waves Hour. Let's talk a little about your book, How the South Won the Civil War. You have five previous books, all of which deal with similar parts of how the South won the Civil War, it struck me that this is almost like a compendium, uh, a digest of all of that information. What prompted you to write this particular book? And is that kind of what you were going for? That's a very good catch. In fact, it's very different than my previous books because what I'm most known for, I think, is my ability to do research. I love research. I love watching a world come alive around me. I always compare it to the holodeck and Star, Star Trek. You know, you go into a new era and you start to fill in the walls around you. And there is nothing to me more magical than that. It's like I get to create my own movies, if you will. And then once they're all done and, I, and I've filled everything out again, I get to step out of them and enter a new holodeck and start all over again. So I've always been known for my ability to research, but it was funny, you know, I, I'm in my late 50s, and after I finished the last book, I spent a lot of time working on some theoretical material um, that someday I may publish, but there were a bunch of books I wanted to write. And I said to a friend, you know, I, I this is the book I want to write, and, and he said, well, that's good, no one's going to read it, it's boring. And I was like, but I like it. And then I said, well, here's another one. He's like, yeah, maybe. And, you know, we went through a whole bunch of them. And then I said, but, you know, there's a little article I want to write first. And it's kind of an article about how really what's going on in the East is this struggle between oligarchy and democracy and that the North really should have won that after the Civil War, but they didn't because everybody moved West. And in the West, it really kind of got a new lease on life. And the guy snapped to attention and he goes, that's a prize winning book. And I went, really? I think it's an article. So then I was talking to my agent. I did the same thing, went through all the books I wanted to write. And she said, yeah, okay. Yeah, me, yeah, me. no, no, the one I loved. No, no one's going to read that. I still love that book. And then I said, but, you know, I think I want to write this little article. But somebody told me they thought it was a bigger book than that. And I told her the idea. And she went, that's the one I want. 
But it took me about four years to actually work it out. It's a very complicated book. And what it is intended to do then, and there is some, some important original research in that book, but it really was intended to take a look at what I thought after 30 years of immersing myself in American political history from the beginning until yesterday, what were the patterns I saw and what interested me? And that's the book that came out. And at the end, you say it's dense, it is indeed. It's, it's designed in such a way that you're supposed to be able to read each section as an independent essay. So that, I hope, helps a little bit with the density. But at the end of the day, it was really intended to be, you know, here's what I think about American society at large. You make a connection, and it's a connection I never saw before, and that's between the rise of the right wing in America and the oligarchy and the myth of the individual cowboy in the West. So I'd I'd like you to make that connection between conservatism today, the slavery battles of the mid-19th century and the intervening moment, the fact that the individual as personified by the cowboy, how those elements connect. To do that, I got to take you back to the Civil War. One of the things that I didn't deal with at all in this book, but I think is kind of a fun way to think about America or an important way to think about America is the idea that really the central question to American life until the Civil War was, are we a nation? You know, can we be separated? And the Civil War proved that we could not be separated, but it did not tell us what we were going to become. And it also did not say who was going to be able to have a role in the decision about what we were going to become. And one of the things that happens during the Civil War, when the Republican Party holds a majority in in Congress and, of course, holds the White House with Abraham Lincoln, is they do one thing that most people don't realize the Republicans do. Yeah, they're fighting the war, they're bringing people into the, um, into the government in huge numbers, they're doing huge amounts of contracting and all that. They're spending a lot of money, they're putting forth a lot of different programs like the Homestead Act that puts people on land, like the Land Grant College Act that gives us our state universities, like uh, the railroads that are going to take people across the country. But they also develop our first system of national taxation. It's the Republicans during the Civil War that invent national taxation in America, including the income tax. Now, let's leave that there for a second. The other thing that they're going to do at the end of the war is they are going to end human enslavement except for commission of a crime. But essentially, initially, it looks in 1865 as if they're inviting African-American men, and I'm going to be talking about men here, into the body politic. Now, not as voters initially. The voting is going to come in 1867, and then it's going to be codified in 1868 and 1870. But what they're doing is they're saying... Our government is now going to be big enough and strong enough that it can field this military and it can create uh, colleges and it can charter corporations. It's going to be this very powerful government and it's going to take money out of your pocket to make that happen. And from the beginning in the North during the Civil War, the Democrats who weren't real, they were war Democrats, but they weren't real keen on Abraham Lincoln and on the Republican agenda. From the beginning, they said, you are crushing the individual. You are creating this this behemoth state. They called it an empire, actually, that is going to destroy America. And it's not an accident that when John Wilkes Booth assassinates Abraham Lincoln, he says, Six Semper Tyrannus, which is a line, of course, from Julius Caesar, one of his favorite Shakespearean plays, but also the state motto of Virginia, thus always to tyrants, the idea of somebody who has this government that's going to crush the individual. Okay, I took all that time to set that up because the way this plays out during Reconstruction, if you think about it, very few of us can conjure up in our minds famous African Americans from the immediate post-war years. There were some, Robert Smalls, of course, and um, the people who went on to sit in, in the Senate, Hiram Rebels, for example. There are certainly labor leaders. But the images we have of African Americans, famous African Americans, tend to come from later. Frederick Douglass, who's famous sort of before the war and then a little bit later. But that immediate post-war years, if you think about our images of Reconstruction, what we really remember from the immediate post-Civil War years is the cowboy. 
The American cowboy was lionized. He really rises in 66, 67, and he's really done for by 86, 87. So he's only operating for about 20 years. And the reality is that uh, American cowboys, about a third of them were men of color, and they had lives that were very similar to the lives of industrial workers back east. They didn't make a lot of money. Their conditions were terrible, just terrible. Um, you know, one of the reasons that, that cowboys would sing is because you wanted to know where the other guys on the crew were in case the cattle stampeded because they would stampede right over the cowboys and literally flatten them into the ground. So their working conditions are terrible too, but because of their timing, they get picked up and celebrated primarily by Democrats immediately after the war as the quintessential American. So back east, where the Republican Congress is trying to level the playing field between the the formerly enslaved people and their former enslavers by trying to guarantee equal access to resources, for example, equal access to education, and trying to guarantee that there's going to be a level economic playing field. What happens is the Democrats look at that and they say, this, what we're seeing back east, is socialism. And they use that word socialism, and by 1871, communism. And by that, they do not mean 20th century socialism or communism, which is a system of government. They are drawing from an earlier tradition in the case of socialism from the 1840s when they were new sort of utopian communities, especially in the, the East. Or they're drawing after March of 1871 from the image of the Paris Commune, where people known as communards or communists took over the city of Paris after the Franco-Prussian War and turned it into a worker-led state, which comes back to America as a vision of workers run amok. And what people, Democrats say, beginning really in about 1870, 1871, letting these poor black people have a say in American society means they are going to vote to redistribute wealth. They're going to vote for leaders who will give them roads and schools and hospitals, all of which have to be paid for with tax dollars. And by definition, those tax dollars are going to come from white people because they're the ones who own property. Now, that ought to sound really familiar. Then in the West, at the same time, you have the rise of the cowboy and they, they lionize the cowboy as the true individualist. You know, the guy who doesn't want anything from the government. Well, that's ridiculous. The cowboys can only survive because of government contracts and because of government protection from the indigenous tribes that are fighting at that point and because of the railroads coming in that move the cattle out and because of government contracts. But the image amongst the Democrats is that a cowboy is an individualist who wants nothing of government and who takes care of his women folk. In the cowboy imagery, there is no image of the people who are building up the West the same way the men are, which is women. I mean, we know you really couldn't survive in the West without a female network. You know, at this point, we know that. But there's this image of the, the cowboy as an individualist. So if you take those two tropes coming out of the 1870s, the idea on the one hand that an activist government trying to level the playing field is somehow socialism or communism, and what stands against that is this individualist embodied by the cowboy, you really see that retaking American society in the 1950s after the passage of Brown versus Board of Education of 1954, when the government is once again stepping in to try and level the playing field between white Americans and black Americans. And opponents of that insist that this is a form of communism. And you see this in any number of places, but dramatically you see it in um, a national review, which William F. Buckley Jr. begins to publish. 1955, one of the first things he does is he runs uh, stories about how desegregation is, in fact, an attack on individualism. And you see it in the rise of cowboy imagery on television. There's like 10 Westerns on TV at that time. And increasingly, you see this emphasis on the American cowboy as the American individualist. And that works its way into American politics through Barry Goldwater. 
1964. And of course, one of Goldwater's key supporters is Ronald Reagan, who uses that cowboy imagery really dramatically. And the, the Republican Party, as it gets taken over by the extremist wing of the party, by the movement conservatives, increasingly hits on this idea of hyper individualism, what I've come to call toxic individualism, as being the centerpiece of America, when in fact, it was always based on a specific political image that was designed to carry water for what was essentially the reimposition of a racial superstructure on the American South. We get this completely different history until I saw Watchmen. I didn't know the Tulsa massacre had happened. And I, you know, on Facebook, I talked to people who said they grew up in Tulsa. They didn't know what happened. Well, you know, the, the historical profession has uh, you know, certainly has a role to play in that. Certainly politics have a role to play in that. I will say that, again, to go back to where my last book came from, you know, I am basing it on the work of really fabulous young scholars and older scholars as well. But there's a lot of really astonishingly terrific work out there. And I hate to start mentioning names because I will forget people, but my notes are deliberately designed to drive people toward really fabulous histories. You've been listening to an interview with Heather Cox Richardson, whose book is How the South Won the Civil War. If you go to Facebook, you can find Letters from an American. Where can people see the video cast? On Tuesdays and Thursdays on Facebook. At 4 o'clock on Tuesdays, I take questions about the news, the historical background of the news. And on Thursdays, I, I just talk about history, uh, where I'm finishing up a, a series on the Republican Party that was really only designed to keep people entertained during the pandemic, but I really didn't expect the pandemic was going to keep on going on so long. They are then posted to my YouTube channel. Again, where can people read Letters from an American other than Facebook? If you go to all one word, heathercoxrichardson.substack.com, the discussions are behind a paywall, but the letters are free and they will always stay free. An extended version of this interview can be found as a Radio Walensky podcast in the Area 941 section of the kpfa.org website. You're listening to the Book Waves, Art Waves Hour. I'm Richard Walensky, and coming up now, the Art Waves Theater portion of the program. My guest is playwright Laurel Olstein. Among her plays are They Promised Her the Moon, which was playing at Theater Works Palo Alto when the pandemic hit and was shut down prematurely. Laurel Olstein is the author of another play, Pandora, which is video streaming free through theaterworks.org from next Thursday, September 24th at 6 p.m. until Monday, September 28th at 6 p.m. It's a modern take on the Pandora myth. Laura Lowstein has written many plays over the course of several years. She started out as an actress, and she also worked with Tim Robbins and the Actors Gang. We're going to talk first about Pandora and how this came about. What are people going to hear? Is this kind of like a table read that's going to be online? Well, it's a, a Zoom reading, which I think some people are, are getting used to this sort of Brady Bunch look of boxes. But hopefully the theatricality of this play will come through on the Zoom. It hasn't been in production. It's a new play and it's a, a new work that will be rewritten, I'm sure, and worked on. So we had a workshop, actually. We did three days of a couple of hours each day of rehearsal. And then we recorded it on Zoom. So all the actors are in their homes, separate squares, which is a challenge for the actors, for sure. And it's also a challenge for a play because you're not really connecting in the same way that you would on a stage, obviously. But you hear the text and the actors, since we did have the opportunity to rehearse it, they were able to play off each other and understand what the other actor was, how they were reacting. Because obviously, if you're not in the same room, it's a very different experience. But I think this works quite well in Zoom, actually, this play, which I was very excited about because there's some comedy in it, which is a challenge on Zoom because sometimes timing is a little off. But it really seemed to work well. And there's some physical comedy, too, that is a challenge because you're really just acting head and shoulders here. But you will hear uh, someone reading stage directions because you don't see what obviously there's no set. We did have the actors sort of costume themselves out of their closets, which was quite fun and wonderful. <laughs> 
Giovanna Sardelli, who directed it, just did a lovely job using the technology that we're all learning now more to how can we bring a new play, a reading to an audience? Because this is just the first time that they're trying this at Theatre Works to do a new work as a reading, because it's something that they're very much involved in and supported in that theater company does. And they want to bring more readings to their audience. And it's the first try at it. If you were going to see this on the stage, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. The curtain opens. Yeah. What do you see? And who are these people? The entire play takes place on an island, on the beach. And in the background, you would perhaps see uh, the lighthouse that is on the beach. And Pandora is, it's the first day of her life. What my thought about this is rethinking the Pandora box myth. What if a woman rewrote, reshaped, rebooted the Pandora's box myth? And that's the premise of this play. So there are goddesses in it and gods, but they're played as people. They have powers. I don't want to say too much about it because it's actually fun to discover it. The thing that's wonderful is to watch Pandora, the actress Pandora, uh, Katie Sullivan does a fabulous job. This is the first day of her life being born and, and seeing life through fresh eyes. And she's given a box filled with the ills of the world like the original myth? Yes, she is. At a certain point in the play, she is given the gift of a box by a Zeus character. What it is very much focused on is on the women, the goddesses. See Pandora, she's the first human woman. So she's the first human made in their image, not in a man's image. So the goddesses come down And just seeing themselves, their image in a human changes them. It's a bit of a feminist play, I have to say, because Pandora's box basically blames a woman for releasing all the ills in the world. But my take on it is all those ills were there already. She's not going to take the blame in my play. This began as a commission from Getty Villa. Did they approach you? Did you approach them? Ralph Flores, who who is the artistic director at at the Getty Villa, had talked to me and asked me if I had something that I wanted to do as far as a workshop production, because that's what they do. Only Roman or Greek myths. Pandora's box just came to my mind. I was fascinated with that myth. Never been really any play based on that myth. Not that I knew of. And so I approached them, I pitched them the idea that that's what I would like to work on. And they were excited about it. They do workshops, very few, like one a year or two a year, maybe up at Getty. And so this is something that might happen in the future there. But it gave me the opportunity to think about this myth. Giovanna Sardelli read my play. We had a reading of it actually uh, after... They Promised Her the Moon, my play was canceled, sadly, because of the virus. So I was working on this play that I'd had sitting there waiting to be worked on. And we thought, let's uh, let's see if we can get actors together and read it. So that was how that came about. When you began thinking about Pandora and you began thinking about all this, What other ideas did you have that didn't quite work? And then you realize, well, wait a second, I've got to make this the first woman. Or was that always there? That's the story. I mean, she's Eve. I mean, she's, you know, the woman who ruins paradise, right? That is the myth. I was fascinated by it. And I thought it really spoke to so many things in the world today about all of these evils that are being released into the world that actually were there, but they're being brought out more. And my feeling how many women actually, women could save the world. I guess that's the simplest way I can put it. (laughs) I, I believe that women could save the world. So the women who are in power in other countries right now seem to be handling this pandemic better than other people, (laughs) males. (laughs) Better than the men. (laughs) Certainly better than the men. And so I found that the more I worked on it, the more relevant it seemed, this play. And it really is about women saving the world. The the way I am writing this play, that rewriting this myth. This was originally, of course, 
built for the stage and hopefully in a couple of years or less it will find its way to the stage most plays these days are only one act of about 90 minutes is this one act two acts Right now, obviously, again, that could always change <laughs> at this point, but it is a full-length one act. I actually got to work on They Promised Her the Moon in the New Works Festival at Theatre Works and at the Old Globe with Giovanna a couple years ago, and that's how that play was able to grow to its full life. So they do a beautiful job of supporting new plays, Theatre Works. Their New Works Festival's are just fantastic because you have actors, you have a director, you get rehearsal time, you have a reading in front of an audience, and then you get an, more rehearsal after that first reading and you get to do another reading, which is just fantastic. Of course, that's not possible right now with this process. Uh, that's the one thing I think I'm missing, of course, a lot is that I won't get really to be in a room and hear the reaction of an audience to the play. But I got so much out of the workshop of being able to, to hear it and work with these wonderful actors and director. And I'm excited to have it go out into the world and, and see how it plays. So then afterward, you watch it. And let's say Giovanna is on a phone with you while you're watching it. And then you kind of take notes on what works and what doesn't. Is that how this would work then? I won't be able to do the process that they usually have done in the past in the full New Works Festival because it's going to be streaming for several days. I believe there might be a survey afterwards that people can answer questions or, or give reactions to the play. And that would be the way that I will hear the, the reactions to people and obviously friends who watch it and Giovanna and I maybe watching it together. That would be kind of fun. Of course, we're in different cities, but <laughs> it's a very interesting process that's different and new to all of us, this technology with theater. Well, I think one thing, of course, you could do is you could have, if you have an iPad or, or a phone, is have Giovanna on the phone watching it on her computer while you're watching it on yours. We could actually experience it together, but we wouldn't <laughs> have we wouldn't have the the audience, particularly when there's some comedy. It's like the actors they're not getting the reaction of a, an audience laughing, which is a challenge, but that's true and when people do film, obviously when actors do film and television they have that. But that's why theater is so special and so different is because we're all experiencing it in the room together and it's it's alive, you know. Laurel Alstein, let's go back a bit on the last play. They promised her the moon. I saw that play down at Theater Works during its sadly brief run. Uh, how did you come across Jerry Cobb, the um, pilot who hoped to get to be the first woman in space? Well, that actually has been a very long process. It's, it's fascinating to me. That story kind of found me. Honestly, 10 years ago, I started writing a short story about a female astronaut. And I Googled first female astronaut because I didn't know enough about it. And I really totally assumed Sally Ride would be what I'd see, which she was there. But down the Google list was Jerry Cobb, born in 1931. And I had never heard of her. And then it opened, talk about a Pandora's box. It, it opened this incredible stories that I've never heard of, like the Mercury 13 women that were all being tested and passed tests at the same time as the Mercury 7 guys in 1960. And I started reading about Jerry Cobb and her life and what she went through and how she fought to get into space and Jackie Cochran. And I couldn't stop. I truly went down a rabbit hole about that. And I applied to a fellowship at the University of Oklahoma that they were looking for a playwright who was working on a new play, who would also teach a playwriting course and they would support the new play. And it just happens that Jerry Cobb was born in Norman, Oklahoma, which is where the University of Oklahoma is. So it was the perfect place to start writing that play. And I got to work on the play there with a student production. And of course, when you're working with a student production, you get to and they want more characters, as many as you want. <laughs> At that point, there were like 20 characters in it. 
and they loved it. And it was a fabulous experience there. I left there knowing I wanted to make it a more producible play and started rewriting it and figuring out how to do it with a smaller amount of actors that was reasonable and came to the fact that I could do it with six actors. I did an off-Broadway showcase production that was wonderful and I learned so much and I rewrote that. It got to the Old Globe in San Diego They connected me actually with Giovanna then as a director, and we worked in the New Works Festival there. She brought it to Theater Works New Works Festival that next summer. So then it opened in the Old Globe to a fabulous production, and then we got to do a a production at Theater Works, a beautiful production that I'm so pleased that you got to see it. You're listening to an interview with playwright Laurel Olstein, her play Pandora, is video streaming through theaterworks.org from next Thursday, September 24th at 6 p.m. until Monday, September 28th at 6 p.m. I'm Richard Walensky on the Bookwaves Arts Waves Hour. Did you ever meet Cherry Cobb? Because she died in 2019. Yes, she actually died when we were in rehearsal at the Old Globe, which was really very sad, but she had a very long life. She had spent the last like 40 years of her life as a bush pilot in the Amazon. I never did meet her because of her experience with the press and with society. She really stayed kind of hidden, quiet life, the the last part of her life. She had a, a website that was online for quite a while, um, selling her books that she wrote uh, about herself autobiographies. I emailed her and we emailed back and forth. I think it was her that was emailing me, you know, and then she kind of stopped and said she was still on the Amazon. That was like eight years ago. She was quite a hearty, incredible woman, but she went through a lot. I mean, if you saw the play, you you know, she was sadly not able to achieve what she had dreamed that she could. Laurel Olstein, let's go back even further. When I was looking At your biography, I noticed that you began as an actress with small roles in Falcon Crest, Switched at Birth, Married with Children, and Dear John. So you started out, as many playwrights did, as an actress? Oh, yes. And actually, I started off as an actress on stage. I was at San Francisco State, where I went to undergrad. I actually was at the Eureka Theater, which years ago, at the beginning there, when Angels in America was starting there. I loved theater. Theater was always my heart and soul, my church. I worked in companies very often. I began to do devised theater work as well. And then I was did theater in Minneapolis for years. And then I moved back to Los Angeles, which is where I was born and got involved with the the Actors Gang, Tim Robbins Theater Company. And I was in that for 15 years as an actor. And I did some television because I was in LA and I wanted to make some money. <laughs> Didn't love it as an actress. My heart was always in theater. And I started writing when I was in Minneapolis. I wrote a one-woman show for myself about Dorothy Parker. And then I started feeling that as an actor, I wasn't in control of my creative life enough. I, I'm, I needed to have more control. And as an actor, you really, you have to wait to be cast. So as a writer, I felt like I could do more. And I directed too. I directed some of my own work and I, I love working with actors. I love collaboration. And that's what theater is the best for. What got you involved in theater to begin with? You know, I've always, always loved it. It's interesting. I I mean, I was born in Los Angeles, but all of my relatives are New Yorkers. And we used to go to New York as a family ever, you know, when I was little. And my grandmother taking me to Broadway shows all the time. I just fell in love with theater immediately. I just don't remember not loving theater. The magical feeling of being in the room watching actors, experiencing it at the same time they were doing it. Nothing between you and that story in the dark and experiencing it with other people. I just, it's magical to me. What was your first role? I mean, how did you get your first role? And what was it like the first time you were on stage? 
You know, that's funny. My first role, I don't know that I've ever thought of it. I used to write my own little plays when I was a kid and make my parents watch them. I can't even remember my first role. Isn't that funny? I know once I went to college at San Francisco State, I was in so many plays. I did everything. I said yes to absolutely everything. And I did Shakespeare. I did comedy. I did contemporary. I did some musicals, but I'm not a, I'm a character singer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say I'm not a great singer, but if it's a real character voice. When the Actors Gang did Medea Macbeth Cinderella, which was quite an event with Cornerstone Theater, I did play the stepmother in Cinderella, and I had to sing for that, and that was fun. But I don't remember my first play. Isn't that funny? Well, what was your first playwriting experience? I was involved in San Francisco a theater in the city doing a lot of new plays. I, I did a, quite a lot of new plays. And I love the idea of working with writers. I guess that was part of it too. And actually, I had a very intense tragedy in my life. My father killed himself. And it was shocking, to say the least. And I was in my early 20s. And I honestly didn't know what else to do with the feeling. And I wrote a play about it. I was working at a theater company at the time, and honestly, I sort of like vomited out that play. I mean, it just like I, I had to, it was not chronological. It was all over the place. It was magic realism. You wouldn't have known it was real, like what I was talking about. I mean, that it was my life if you didn't know me. We did a reading of it, and it was so powerful to me that I had taken this experience of mine and made myself feel like I had some control over it by ha having something happen on stage and giving the character who was me some peace. And it was the beginning of feeling that that was what I really wanted to do, that I could express myself in a way so much deeper as a writer. I talk to a lot of novelists, and one of the questions I ask is, after they're done, how does the book change you? Mm. What do you gain by having written it? And it sounds like for that first place, obviously something changed in you. Mm -hmm. As a playwright, you're basically working on seven or eight plays at once. Does that same thing happen when you're finally finished or doesn't it? I think it really depends on the play. I've also written some prose and some screenplays. And so it also, de it depends what you're writing, where the writing comes from. Like that play particularly was very powerfully from my gut. <laughs> um, not all plays are that. Actually, that play, I have to say, had some humor in it as well, because that's very important to me. I love to make people laugh. I love to make an audience laugh. And it feels so good to be in an audience and hear them laugh at my plays. It's finding humor in dark times. I, I write a lot of dark comedies, I think. And Pandora is a dark comedy. I think that I find once I finish a play, I want to hear it in front of an audience. And it's a little different than novelists, I suppose, because the experience is not complete without the audience for theater. What about screenplays? It's interesting because I've written several screenplays. Some have been optioned, some I've been paid for, but none have been done. <laughs> and it's sad. <laughs> you know, it's hard in that way because if you put your heart and soul into something and then it's just going to sit in the desk or sit in a computer forever. But in theater, I know I can produce theater. I can produce my own. If a theater company is not going to do my play, I can get people together and do it. I have. I've produced my own plays. A play of mine that I always loved, my husband's favorite play that I wrote called Esther's Mustache. Nobody was producing it. I was sending it out like crazy. And he said, let's produce it. And it was fabulously fun. And because it got produced, another theater produced it later. It was a wonderful, empowering thing. And with screenplays, I think unless you're a writer, director, you don't have that kind of control. Obviously, what could easily happen there is that your screenplay can be so distorted by the director that you barely recognize it. Right. And of course, it could be rewritten by 10 other people. Too. Exactly. And theater, theater is a writer's medium. Definitely. 
Uh, I think TV, though, I mean, there's some wonderful writing on TV right now. And I think a lot of playwrights uh, gravitate towards that now, too, obviously, to make some money. But also, it's a, an interesting medium. Have you thought about being in a writer's room then? Definitely. Yeah, I'm actually um, working on two things, two possibilities of things for television, limited series ideas. I love that because, again, there's something being in a writer's room is it's a collaboration again, which I love. I love working with other people, other artists. I was talking around the same time and his play got trashed over at The Magic uh, with a writer named Ricardo Perez Gonzalez. Uh, playwright. And he had been working on uh, in the writer's room of Designated Survivor for Netflix. And I asked him how that changed his writing. And he said that when you've got that input on a regular basis from other people and you're working with other people and you're honing things down, you change as a playwright because you pick up so much. Yeah. I mean, I think the difference to writing in your, your own little office, just you and your computer to in a room with people and constantly people are rewriting you and you're rewriting them and ideas are flowing in a room. I think it can be a wonderful experience. It also can be a horrible experience. <laughs> I love getting feedback. I mean, that's why I love workshops with actors and a director and a dramaturg and workshop and designers. A play is built from what you bring in the text, but then it keeps getting layers and layers from the director, from the designers, and then finally from the audience, where I think in a writer's room, you're just working on the text, obviously. So it's a different experience, but I think it's, it can be, again, it can be a wonderful experience or it can be a horrible experience. I think it depends on the, the group of people. Laurel Olstein, how many plays are you working on now and... Hopefully, we will <laughs> we'll be back in theaters within a year, I would hope. I hope so. Yes, I hope so. I am still wor working on Pandora. I mean, it's a, it's a work in process. And I have another play that I'm working on. I actually have a memoir that I've written that I'm working on, too. So I'm sort of writing in several mediums right now. If I recall correctly, They Promised Her the Moon actually was recorded and did spend some time online and who knows, may come back. It was such a beautiful production. What they streamed, though, was really archival footage that they had had. So, you know, it's beautiful and it is a, a representation of the play, but it's not like being in the room. So hopefully we can be in the room again soon. You've been listening to an interview with playwright Laurel Olstein. Her play Pandora video streaming through theaterworks.org from next Thursday, September 24th at 6 p.m. until Monday, September 28th at 6 p.m. For more information, you can go to theaterworks.org. The Bookwaves Artwaves Hour is taking a three-week vacation during the fall KPFA Fun Drive. KPFA is a unique role to play in this era of pandemic, widespread climate disruption, and incipient fascism. With information and analysis unavailable elsewhere on the radio dial. Please help keep KPFA alive. I'm Richard Walensky on the Book Waves Arts Waves Hour. Hey, this is David Talbot, author of Season of the Witch and the Devil's Chessboard. In these days when news and culture are so formatted and corporatized, I rely on KPFA more and more. Shows like Flashpoints, Project Censor, Democracy Now!, and for fun, Dirk Richardson's Here and Now. They keep me going, and I know they keep you going too. So please join me in supporting KPFA. It's an essential community resource. Thank you. Hi, this is Nomi Prince. As everyone knows, we live in a world in which it gets harder and harder each day to wade through the seemingly endless stream of lies. That's why now, more than ever, it's crucial for brave and objective media like KPFA to thrive. Public radio serves the public, period. So please consider donating whatever you can today to help KPFA remain a beacon of truth. Donate today at kpfa.org. We 
We love trees. True? We love forests. So KPFA is delighted to present a webinar with naturalist, artist, and writer Obi Kaufman, author of the California Field Atlas. This is about his gorgeous new book, Forests of California. Obi's luminous watercolors mingle beautifully, as you'll see, with his inspiring prose. Brian Edward Steekert will talk with Obi and display his art on September 23rd, Wednesday, 7 p.m. The Eventbrite link is on the KPFA website. Please join us. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.